and uh, Lori's was the one from, you know, with the link for live. tonight. Okay, we're live. Maybe that's so, a sign. Mary and Lee, just to let you know, we just went live. Okay. And we can Thank hear you. you. <laughs> um, welcome to the March 27th meeting of the Water Resources Advisory Committee. Uh, my name is Spiro Mitrakasis. I'm going to be um, chairing the meetings, uh, this meeting today, and would like to um, take a roll just to see who's, if we have a quorum and who's, who's participating in the meeting today. Uh, Lee Rowley. Here. Mary Craig. Here. John Deliso. Here. Here's my list. Ken Smith. Here. Myself, that's five. Uh, I do not see anyone else out there. That is a quorum, so we Bro, can. I'm here at George Perkins. Say it again? George. Oh, there's George. George, here. No, really in South Carolina, but present. <laughs> <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> First word on the agenda is um, update project status and schedule. Are you guys ready to uh, do that? Let us know who you are before you do. Lou Ragazzino with Wright Pierce. I'm the OPM for the project. So this, in the past two weeks, we've received some significant deliverables. Uh, the first item is for the water resource recovery facility. We received from CDM Smith the 60% design plans and specifications. They've also been submitted to the town. So we are in the process of beginning our review of that submission. Um, going back up to um, item A1 on the agenda, we also had an internal uh, meeting and discussion on the groundwater discharge permit, um, which CDM Smith will brief us on shortly. Uh, rel rel related to the collection system, contract two is advertised for bidding. That's the documents you see uh, before Mike in front of you on March 22nd and then contract three will be advertised for bidding this Wednesday March 29th um, since our last meeting we also prepared a cash flow estimate looking at all six contracts over the duration of construction to try to see how that cash would be distributed to the various contracts that was provided to um, Thank you. Jeff. Can I just ask you to pause for a second? Uh, Lee, Mary, George, are you guys uh, keeping up? Do you understand where we are on the progress report that was emailed to us before the meeting? Yes. I didn't get I did not get it. I got it. So um, obviously we can't get it to you now unless um, you go into your email. But if you're That's having... Okay. I'm, listening. Right. I'm listening. So what I wanted to offer you is if, an opportunity to interrupt if we're going too fast to slow us down or at least stop us if you need to ask something before we move on. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Lou. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, action items for the OPM um, include the comments on the 60%. We'll be looking at those in the next few weeks and getting those to CDM Smith. And then on the back of the uh, progress report are some key milestone dates that were achieved. As I mentioned, the 60% was submitted on the 22nd, as well as contract two was advertised. Bids are due on that contract April 6th, barring any addenda. And then we anticipate the contract three to go out on March 29th. For folks at home who are wondering <coughs> what our jargon is uh, referring to, contract one refers to which part of the project? Contract one refers to the water resource okay. recovery facility. Contract two is which section of Route 28? Contract two is Route 28 from Long Pond to North Main. Great. And contract three? Contract three would be from the Parkers River Bridge along Route 28 to Long Pond and then including a portion of <coughs> Drive. So by the end of the month, we will have gone out to bid for three of the six components in phase one? No, two. 
two. Contract two and contract Sorry, two is not going out yet, for April 6th. No, contract one won't be going out. Contract one is, as Lou mentioned, is the resource I'm recovery sorry. facility. That won't be until later this November year. This so November it's just contracts two and three, the yeah. first two of the collection system. Okay. Is that typical or a progression on the contracts? Nothing's really typical. <laughs> it all depends. They're all community specific. In this case, we had some other factors entering in here. Um, one is that we wanted to, we've got obviously a, all of phase one runs along Route 28. So the original intent was the western part of Route 28 from Barnstable to the Parkers River Bridge was supposed to be part of a mass DOT project. We're still hoping that's the case. Um, which wouldn't start until later um, in the schedule. So we wanted to see if we could get some more work done in Route 28 so that it, the, the road isn't torn up from one end of the town to the other. So contract two and contract three, we intend to get out early. In addition to getting bid prices in before town meeting, that's obviously an important component as well. So. Um, because of the schedule constraints, we couldn't get the, the resource recovery facility out to bid before the town meeting, but we did our best and uh, we're halfway there to get at least these two contracts out to bid, so we have bids in hand prior to town meeting. Mr. Chair, can I just ask a question? Uh, On um, the bid which is going out for the resource recovery facility in November, November 3rd, typically how long is that bid advertising and the selection process, just so I understand, this is for my own edification, and maybe the people listening, uh, how long that typically takes. Yeah, I'll let uh, Matt, I think Matt Pitt is our project manager for the resource recovery facility. He's uh, more in tune with the okay. schedule for bidding for, the, for that project. Sure. Um, folks can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, for a project of this size, uh, there's two bid events generally, um, the filed sub-bid opening, which would be a uh, in a, a lot of categories. Sometimes we'd even split that up. And the general bid opening, a more direct answer to your question would be something about 10 weeks, maybe eight would be kind of pushing it. 10 would be a little more comfortable in terms of from the time that we advertise to the time that we get to the general bid opening. Okay. Thank you, Matt. If, no I, yeah, if I might, uh, I'm concerned with the whole of the project uh, we are getting in focus with half of the project, uh, mainly from Parker River to Bass River, but without a clear understanding of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts participation with the town of Yarmouth, um, you know, we potentially have a problem. We've been operating from day one on the theory that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts would be our partner on the eastern half, if you will. Um, is there any clarity that can be, I realize you're speaking for others, but I don't know, Jeff, if you yeah, want to I can address comment that. on that. We're continuing to work with Mass DOT on the partnership. In fact, we had a uh, meeting with them uh, just this afternoon to uh, talk about how we can continue to coordinate with them on the project. Uh, we have a definitive time frame to award this, and we were very clear with them that that's June 30th of 2024, uh, which is just over a year away, but is fast approaching. Uh, so they know our time, time frame, and we've talked about what that might look like. Uh, while they won't be ready to do their overall project in that time frame, because they've got a number of components related to intersection improvements and sidewalks and uh, some right-of-way issues that'll have to impact a time frame we are talking with them about doing an advanced utility uh, component to the project, and that'll be very important for us to get both water and sewer in that stretch. Uh, there are other possibilities, uh, even if we had to do a project outside of uh, a cooperative project with them, to do advanced utility work, where we get a permit in advance to put in the water and, and sewer work. Uh, so we're working through those different possibilities with them. Uh, we do have a definitive time frame and schedule that I mentioned before, and, and we're committed to making that and trying to work with them as close as possible to get elements of their project to happen at the same time. Uh, well, it was, well, well, you know, I've been a part of the committee now almost five years, and uh, from day one, the uh, part of the carrot to the town was that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was going to be our partner. Uh, in fact, I think four or five years ago, they were stating 
a much earlier schedule for the rebuilding of, of 28 uh, uh, Parker's River to Barnesville Town Line piece. And uh, you know, to me, uh, I want the project, uh, but we also need the money. And uh, it's one thing to get permits from the state. It's another thing to get dollars from the state. So I don't know what uh, various leaders in the town can do, including selectmen and you know, various uh, state representatives, members of the legislature. But if there ever was a time uh, for people to step up to the plate, sooner is better than later. Absolutely. Okay. Any questions from uh, Lee, Mary, George? No. You guys um, no. want to continue? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Spiro, uh, just one. Um, with re regard to the uh, the funding from the state, when were they going to be making a commitment on that? I, I, is it August when we were talking about the SRF and um, and other fu funds? Uh, there is a draft intended use plan currently, and we do expect that to be finalized in April. Uh, so next month we should know definitively. I don't have any reason to believe our project wouldn't change from being the number one ranked project on that list, and uh, that just final, uh, finalized what they've already put out as uh, that list. Uh, then shortly after town meeting, we'll uh, make our formal application. Um, you know, CDM Smith probably could go into more detail about the, the process of that, but no, it'll be in advance of August. I, I think, Lee, you're thinking of the absolute deadline uh, for this round would be an August filing, but we're going to be doing it in advance of that. Okay. The, I guess the issue is uh, in responding to the public's questions at our town meeting, um, have we got a, a, a good pat answer? as to the sequence and uh, commitments from, from the state uh, on a timeline that coincides with our awarding the contracts. Um, my concern is we're asking for over $200 million and I'm thinking the public is going to show up to the town meeting and going to ask some questions as to how much we're going to have, besides the resources that we put together, which are very good, um, a commitment from from the state and uh, maybe some federal money as well. Uh, will we have any answers at that point, or are we going to be still in a in a position to just say that we won't have the commitment until August? Can I answer that? Um, yes, I, I want to just address that a little bit. First and foremost, uh, the, the financing plan um, is, is put together, and this project is predicated upon our participation in the state revolving loan program. The timing, the way that program works, uh, the town has already made its application. The state has published its um, priority list for the upcoming year. The town of Yarmouth is number one on the priority list. Um, there's steps that we need to go through before you sign a contract with the, the state, and one of those is appropriating the funds. So I just want to be clear. Um, we're not behind schedule with the state funding. We're ahead of schedule with the state funding, um, and we're in line to receive um, their contracts when we fulfill our own um, obligations uh, under that program, so we'll be prepared to um, directly address any of the questions um, regarding the state financing at town meeting. And I just want every member of the committee to fully understand that the um, SRF program is the strongest part of our, our funding, and um, that is at zero percent, which we've had um, meetings with them indicating we're entirely eligible to receive 0% financing for this project. So um, that is, uh, you know, the, the entire vote that we're going to take is predicated upon that. Okay, uh, Bob, I just have one question. Um, let, 
do we have a fallback position if we go to town meeting and we do not get authorization for the money that we're requesting for the for phase one um, in deference to the consultants if you don't mind Lee do you want to answer that now or do you want to hold it for the no, financial no, I'll, I'll answer that I don't understand what you mean a fallback position the town cannot um, fund this project without an appropriation all right. of the financing um, is together for right now if um, if the town meeting doesn't vote this um, first of all the project will be delayed we will lose our position as the number one priority for state funding so um, it would jeopardize the state funding it would cause um, extravagant delay and um, which would also result in um, I, I think some pretty more uh, we've seen some exotic I would say project escalation that would continue and um, furthermore the town would be vulnerable to the impacts of proposed regulations um, from the State Department of Environmental Protection that would require individual homes uh, to install in innovative and alternative septic systems at a cost far in excess which we'll see a little bit later in the meeting when we talk about what is it going to cost individual property owners so um, the the fallback position is a very dire set of circumstances for the town and its local residents and I, I wish I could sit here and tell you that it was so easy that um, well if we didn't get a vote at town meeting we could just go ahead you know down another um, happy Avenue but that's uh, not the case okay so step one would be the town meeting authorization for funds and then we have to go um, and and the townspeople have to vote in an elect in an election to no uh, no there there is no ballot and we can, no talk, ballot. we can talk about this um, you know more the only reason that you would have a ballot question is if the town sought to um, place this project um, out for on the general taxes for a proposition two and a half um, type of uh, an override and what we'll discuss and I and I, I thought we've been discussing this at length over and over and over um, but I just want to remind folks that we've put together a highly integrated financial management plan for this project which leverages multiple funding sources that are designed specifically first and foremost to limit the amounts that are required from each individual um, homeowner uh, in order to get this system rolling and and I think even more importantly to eliminate the need by leveraging these multiple funding sources eliminate the need for a general property tax increase which would be what would be sought at a, at a ballot question so in order to implement this program um, we require the appropriation of the funds at the town meeting and then the um, initiation of the contracts with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts so this project does not require a ballot question vote okay thank you um, Lou do you want to continue you want to finish uh, the, the memo I'm finished with the OPM Okay, the contract schedule uh, I mean I think it's worth going over the contract schedule it's obviously the only thing you didn't get to specifically it's a little bit redundant but it puts the project in perspective time wise so um, do you want to run us through that or do you want me to just read so for contract one the water resource rec recovery facility the treatment plant um, as I mentioned we just received 60 percent design 90 percent is scheduled for August of this year They'll move forward with 100% plans uh, by the end of October. Give a really nice summary down on item number six. Oh, for the contract, for the construction. Right. I mean, folks want to know when we get, when this thing's going to start, how long it's going to take, <coughs> and so on. This is really... Anticipated that contract one, which is the water resource recovery facility, construction would start in June of 2024. Now, contract two and three, which we mentioned... One is out to bid, one will be put out to bid this week. That construction is anticipated in July of okay, this year. So I guess that's, that's what I was getting to. If projects moving forward, if the uh, appropriation authorizations for 
funding are approved if the contracts go out and come back satisfactory we could be in the ground in july of this year I, one caveat to that okay. uh, mr <laughs> chair is, um, the contract would probably be executed around that time by the time the contractor submits shop drawings and they get approval um, as I indicated, a large part of this work is in Route 28, so the contractor in both of these contracts is not going to be allowed to work in Route 28 between Memorial Day and Labor Day. And that so is because? All, because of the state highway requirements and the summer summertime. For most of us who live here, we kind of know that the yes. state doesn't allow you to tear up Route 28 in July and August. That's correct. Fair so enough. in all li likelihood, you won't actually see a shovel in the ground probably till after Labor Day. Okay, but 2023. can't say where that would start, but uh, this year, correct. Okay. Roughly two years. Uh, contract two, probably two and a half years. Contract three, two years of construction. Great. So that gets us to 2024. You've made note that this, um, the next couple of um, items require DOT coordination? Right. That's uh, what one of the board members alluded to, is that both of those projects are part of a larger mass dot contract, the contract from the Barnstable Town Line, the Parker's River Bridge, and then the contract at the North Main Street intersection. So whether or not those go out, as Mr. Colby indicated, as part of a bigger project or as a standalone project is yet to be determined based on mass dot schedule and funding. But your anticipation is those would be out in 2024? That's the plan. So in order to, as Jeff had indicated, June 30th, 2024 is an important date because under the SRF project uh, program, the contracts would need to, the con construction contracts would need to be executed by June 30th, 2024 in order to qualify for debt forgiveness for the town. And the town's in line to get at least six and a half, 6.6 percent in debt forgiveness on these contracts. So the construction contract needs to be executed by June 30th, 2024. Is that, Bob, does that have something to do with our changing fiscal years on July 1, or the state changing fiscal years on July 1? That's, they established the deadline in conjunction, I, I believe, with the fiscal year, so that's, that's when they set there. Right. It's a nice little... Uh, so it's uh, the first of the fiscal year, I would say. It's a nice little deadline to try to meet. It's an important date. Yes. Fair enough. Good. All right, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is um, a design update. Is that Mike? Yeah, I'll just move quickly. I think you know Lou's covered a lot of these items already. Um, just have a couple of slides. Um, and I think we have them. very tech savvy. In terms of the <laughs> water resource recovery facility, as Lou indicated, we uh, submitted the 60 percent design. Uh, that's currently under review. We'll schedule a workshop with town staff and Wright Pierce to review comments and work through those in early April. And then the next submittal is in August, uh, early August, for the 90 percent design. Yeah, that's actually the old. <coughs> That was last month's <laughs> five dates. So, yeah, that's fine. A lot of these dates are still, so that you'll, your handout's a little different than this, but the, the dates are the same. Again, uh, not to be too repetitive, but as uh, Lou indicated, contract two is currently out to bid. It went out to bid as of last Wednesday. And as I said, you know, I just thought it would be instructive for you to see. We've talked about plans and specs for a long time here, just so you can see what goes into it. So this is contract two. The specifications, this lays out exactly what the contractor needs to install from a technical standpoint, has all the contractual requirements, all the SRF requirements. Um, you know, this is a double-sided document, so contract three will be very similar. Um, and to put in context, the resource recovery facility will be at least two or three volumes of, of this size. And the set of plans here to, uh, to go along with the specifications as well. So contract two, again, is on the street. Uh, the intent is to open bids next Thursday, uh, not this Thursday, uh, 
April 6th. How, how, how many bidders do we expect? Uh, we won't know until... Last minute. Uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't checked in with, with Laurie or Mary to see how many people have pulled, you know, how many potential bidders there are, but, you know, you, you hope we get four or five uh, at this point. Um, and then contract three, uh, again, will be on the street uh, as of next Wednesday, the 29th, and we'll open bids uh, on for that contract on Thursday, April 13th, so the following week, the staggered a week apart. So just to repeat, these are the two contracts that you anticipated having um, bids on before a town meeting. You'll be right. able to evaluate them against what we were, we were budgeting, and Correct. we'll have useful information at that point as to where have we stand financially. Useful information, yes. Actual bid prices, yes. So, um, questions from the the board, the committee. No, sounds good. Guys, good. Online. Um, yes. Yep. Um, I notice we have at least. Bob, you're okay with these guys? Yeah, great. I'm just sort of checking around the room. Do we have department heads in the room would like to jump in? Jay? You all set? All right. Uh, we're finally to a point where we can discuss the actual uh, cost that a property owner would be incurring. And I understand the town manager and his financial team have been working diligently to come up with those um, analysis and those estimates and you're planning to share that with us right now yeah that'd be great I think maybe I'll, I'll stand up for this <coughs> and um, <coughs> so I've got a handout I'd like to reach over and get this is what the, the finances <laughs> of the project <laughs> As we said, they're, they're billing us by the page. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen. What I'm going to do is put That's some why I brought material it. up on the screen here that can hopefully simplify things. And I, and I will get the microphone. <coughs> Thank you, thank you, Jeff. So this evening, I'd like to give you just a little bit of a highlight um, on the overall financial program, which we've been going through um, for some time now. And this chart, I know folks um, have, have seen before. And the, the title, I, I guess, of this presentation is what is it going to cost me uh, it's you know a very expensive project overall um, as you know the town has been working very hard to attempt to leverage multiple funding sources for the sole purpose of lowering the cost to each individual property owner in in the town and in Showing this chart, I, I think you'll recognize it as Bill Scott's chart. I, I do want to um, give some acknowledgement to our assistant town administrator, William Scott, who has put together uh, the financial program and a lot of the detail. Uh, so some of these charts that I'll be going over, um, but um, he's just been doing yeoman's work in uh, um, our office, putting together this program in a way that I personally feel benefits individual property owners uh, tremendously. Now, the chart that we're looking at here, and I'll try to use the mouse to, to show, um, we've got about 10 or so individual financing sources. And all of these sources, you see the, the largest portions of the funding. Um, we've tried to, again, leverage every possible funding source and only use the user fees 
only use betterment programs, things that are paid by local property owners last. And um, folks should know that uh, this project um, largely is being funded through the tourism industry, folks that visit our community. When you're discussing wastewater, the whole issue of financial justice and equity in terms of um, the process really come into question as we enjoy so many visitors to our community, uh, so many users of the commercial resources that we have. Surely there can be a way to come up with a financial program that dictates that these resources are going to be leveraged so that we can lower the cost to the individual property owner and year-round residents. And a couple of key financing sources I want to point to is you see the short-term rental tax at 18.72% of this project. Those are funds that the town collects directly as the charge that the excise taxes on short-term vacation rentals in the community. And we're leveraging um, those funds to go directly to lower the cost to individual residents. And there's a, a second tourism-related short-term rental fund that has been created through the Cape Cod Water Protection Trust Fund. And that is funded by an additional surcharge on the excise tax for the short-term vacation rentals. And it is administered through Barnstable County. And their current regulations stipulate that this funding source, which the town has signed up for, when you rent the properties um, here in town, there's an additional 2.75% tax on those. And, and that 2.75% goes into the Cape Cod Water Protection Trust. And they're covering, through their regulations, approximately 25% of all state revolving fund eligible expenses. So it's critical to point out that the 25% plus the 18% is nearly half of the project is being paid through the visitors to our community, not through uh, direct um, users of, of the system. I mean, they are users of the system, but not year round. So what we're able to do with those larger funding sources, we also have the CPA exemption that we've created a wastewater improvement fund by shifting a percent of the former community preservation um, assessment over to wastewater. That's going to be over 10% of the project. Uh, we have some other smaller um, resources, um, most notable here. And, and I think that this is very conservatively established, is we have the district improvement financing. Now, we've used this model to avoid having a general property tax increase. Through the DIF, which we'll also be voting on the second phase of the DIF at the upcoming town meeting, we're reserving all of the growth in the value of properties from free cash that, that is as a result of the assessments in the district, all of the, the new growth from construction will be reserved to pay for the debt for, for wastewater. So that is a way of reserving new growth um, in the district area for phase one that will help pay for the overall project and lessen the amount that, that has to be paid for um, through the betterment program. Now, the primary user fee, what will it cost me for individual properties that are inside the district? It is proposed that the town will assess a betterment. And very simply, a betterment is an assessment of the proportional cost of the value of the improvement to each individual property. So in order to, to fund this, uh, the town has to assess this per property proportional assessment. And one of the things that I, I want to point out in this financial model, the reason 
it is such a strong model is by using these other funding sources, what we've been able to do is lower this betterment assessment to roughly 15% of the overall total project cost. And, and that is going to uh, be very large in some of the numbers I, I show you coming up. We did benchmarking across the Commonwealth for um, average wastewater projects and a standard model that's been applied in, in very many communities is to assess betterments equivalent to 50% of the overall project costs. In our experience, we've been able to leverage these additional finding, funding sources that limit this from 50% down to 15%. And, and I, I'd, I'd like to show you a little bit more on, on the power of that and how that makes it more affordable for local residents. I have a copy of a betterment model that I want to call up here. Now, a um, few items that we need to talk about on, on the betterment model, which gets to the exact cost for each individ individual homeowner. Um, first and foremost, we talked about assessing a proportional share of the project. How is that done? And this, this model describes exactly how that is accomplished. According to the state guidelines, what we need to do is to break down this project to the proportionate equivalent of a single family home. So basically, what you do in a situation like this is you develop a single family home value per unit of what the assessment will be. Very simply, in, in our case, for the phase one wastewater in the town of Yarmouth, the fim single family dwelling unit, two to three bedroom, has through the state uh, a design flow, 330 gallons per day. That is equal to one unit, and the value of that assessment will be $15,000. That will be the betterment for a single family home in phase one of this project for a two to three bedroom home. There's an additional charge if you get into a four, five, or six bedroom, um, and it's done per bedroom. But the standard design flow for a bedroom is 15,000. Now, if we were to apply that standard that's more common that assesses a 50% betterment, these betterments would be 50,000. And I want to make it clear, it was through the application of those other sources of funds, primarily the use of the short-term rental income funds, the district improvement financing, and the Cape Water Trust, we're able to construct this project at a betterment cost of $15,000 per single family home. And as a point of comparison, we talk about the DEP regulations that have been proposed. The DEP regulations are that without a project like this, every single individual, single family home would have to install an innovative and alternative septic system. The cost to those is valued at approximately 50000 similar to the cost that, that you'd see if we did a 50% betterment. But, but in our case, by limiting the betterment down to 15000 it's a tremendous cost savings to local residents. And we're also able to fund the betterments to individual taxpayers with no upfront expense. A betterment can be selected for a term of up to 30 years. And there's another article that we're hoping to approve at the April town meeting this year that will limit the interest on those betterments to only 2%. So what that means is that local homeowners can take that 15,000 with no upfront costs 
and they can finance that through the town's betterment program on their tax bill for 30 years at 2% interest, which is, is far better than any, any possible funding program that, that you could develop commercially. And if you took the entire 15,000 and went the entire 30 years at 2%, it's equivalent to $510 per year per home on your tax bill. Now, um, in, in addition to the high cost, if you were to f take your innovative and alternative septic system at $50,000, you would not be able to fund that over 30 years, nor would you be able, in all likelihood, to get a 2% loan in certain circumstances, perhaps, but it would be a much shorter term. Number one, the cost of that would be much higher, but in this case, the annual assessment of 510 is actually far less than even the monitoring cost of your innovative and alternative system. So never mind buying it, um, you know, the, the costs are 2000 to 2500 a year just to maintain, perform the testing, and you have to have a contract to do that. So what we're seeing here is um, for uh, this particular project, given the 0% financing that we have, given the mechanisms that we have for the long-term low interest financing of the betterments, uh, the other fu funding sources, uh, we're down to 15,000 per home, which is about 510 per year. Now, how this model works is um, keeping in mind also another key factor in limiting that per home cost is that phase one is comprised of primarily the commercial center of the community along the Route 28 corridor. Every use in that corridor, and this is the um, Department of Environmental Protection's flow table. So every property use is broken down to the design equivalent of a single family home. And I'll show you a little bit of, of how that works if you have a multi-family dwelling, condo units, um, uh, th those types, of even, even a, um, a hotel, motel, it's broken down per bedroom and then matched up with the, the design flow standards from the D Department of Environmental <coughs> Protection. <coughs> and for example, multi-family dwellings, are charged per gallon per bedroom, which you can see the gallon per bedroom is 110 gallons per day. That's the design flow. Now again, a single family home <laughs> is, has an allotment of up to 330 gallons per day of just design flow, not actual flow, but design flow for a proportionate comparison. So each unit of a multifamily dwelling is equivalent to a third of an individual family home. So um, by unit, by bedroom, multifamily calculates out to 5,000 of the 15,000 or, or one third. It's the same for um, hotel, motel is per bedroom, per room is one third of a home and each individual property use is calculated right down to um, commercial. If you see restaurants, which we have a lot of restaurants in that district, um, individual seats dictate how much design flow, which calculates, uh, through this model, every restaurant is, is able to calculate um, exactly what their betterment would be. Uh, for example, um, a restaurant per seat is 35 gallons a day, and that calculates out to be roughly one-tenth of a house. So you would have 10 seats in a restaurant is equivalent 
approximately to, to one home. Um, a few calculations. If you had a, a 50 room hotel is assessed $8,500 annual fee. If you had a 50 seat restaurant, it's $2,704. Per year, and again, single-family home up to three-bedroom up to 510 annually. So, through the state's established guidelines, we're able to break down each individual property usage and calculate them all <laughs> consistent with a single-family home. Mr. Chair, can I ask Bob a question? Bob, just on. The design flow you commented on on restaurants and hotels. Help me understand, do these numbers reflect the seasonality nature of many of our hotels here in Yarmouth? And will those numbers change? You know, you get properties on South Shore Drive, for example, that are only open half a year. How will that affect that, you know, that design flow that you're showing? The design flow is, in, in many of the homes, um, there's homes that are seasonal as well. Yep. And so the design flow is based just on the capacity of the system. Okay. So if you are a seasonal business where you will make um, the, the most savings is that when the system is up and running, your actual costs of operating the system will be based on only the gallons that you actually use. So the key thing is when you analyze the betterment model, it's not based on the actual flow that you use. That's the, all of the O&M costs. Mm -hmm. What we're required to do with the state is take the design flow to create a, a proportionate analysis between what design do we have to reserve for um, a particular business and how that stacks up to the design flow for each individual home. Yeah. So. Um, Just a quick amplification, I think uh, we are under the same constraints when we're building septic systems. Mm -hmm. So you still have to build it to capacity even if you're not using it six months out of the year. So the, des the, the design flow from DEP serves as the guidance for this model and the, um, the numbers are calculated that we have by establishing the 15% right, that we need from Betterments to finance this project, it creates our overall bottom line number, which is approximately $32 million worth of Betterment financing um, of the overall $207 million. And by establishing that, that's the way we can set it um, at that 15000 and then we calculate out for each individual property what those values are, and that's what determines you back into the analysis um, by having the 15,000, it's able to cover um, everything. Now, I, I think one of the important things that I wanted to, if I had the chart, um, I could show you. This, this shows the allocation of the betterments by the primary land uses that are in the current district for, for phase one and, and how, in, you know, in heaven's name, we're able to keep these betterments down. And, and I think local residents in this district should be mindful of the fact that um, the large number of commercial interests are really covering the lion's share of the betterments. Um, and, and I think it is, um, just in, in excess of 80% that is um, assessed just to the businesses. And to, to show you, um, in this model, the hotel motels are about, there's a lot of rooms in, in town, uh, and that, that includes a lot of the, the condominiumized ones, larger developments, is, is those are about 45.5% and that, that takes care of um, um, the commercial ones, there's multifamily dwellings in there, 16%. Office use at 0.7. The restaurants are about 
of the total pie. Uh, we have a nice chunk of assisted living. Uh, supermarkets uh, tend to be low flow design, um, but they support all of the residential and um, single family residences in this district, approximately 18%. This is just phase one. It, well, this is just phase one. As we move into the subsequent phases, we're going to see primarily single family home residences with some multifamily home, far, far less commercial. But I think what's important to point out that <clears throat> through this partnership in handling the areas of tremendous need in the business community first, in addition to uh, removing some of the tremendous obstacles that we've had for private investment here in our community that has really stifled the, the commercial district. What we're able to do is, again, leverage the commercial usage for the local residents to get the treatment plant rolling. Because if it was just single family homes and the treatment plant was included in the mix, it would be a much higher cost per property owner. So through this model, we're able to uh, take advantage of the proportional share of all of these various land uses and single family homes. Again, first, only 15% of the project is betterments. And even of those betterments, only 18% of the betterments is on the single family homes. And by all of the properties acting together, we'll be able to um, finance the plant and the collection system so that phases two and three will not have um, as high of a burden on funding the overall treatment system. They'll pay a proportional share of it, but to a large degree, uh, the commercial will still be somewhat subsidizing the plant overall, um, but uh, the subsequent phases will have the same proportionate share model um, that, you know, hopefully the costs won't escalate tremendously. We're going to try to keep it uh, as, as constant as we can through phases one, two, and three. So um, I'm not sure if I had anything else I wanted to show. Um, this shows some of the more detailed calculations in the summary by land use. Um, that is somewhat helpful, but um, I wanted to make sure that we delved right into the proportionate share model uh, that comes from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The part that's good about it, it um, this has been litigated, this has been um, judged and held up, so it's the recommended best practices for um, assessing the betterments, and I, I think when you combine the, the work we have here on the proportionate share versus leveraging the other sources. We're at a unique point in history. You know, we know that as a result of increasing amounts of development over a long period of time in these critical resource areas that our community is suffering from this nitrogen pollution, that if we're gonna have a safe environmental future for the generations to come, now's the time that we need to begin to clean up this water. And with this particular program, we're poised right now to take advantage of this opportunity to get this plant going. And um, again, it, it's kind of, I just can't get my mind off that earlier question that, that we had of what if we're not successful? Um, this is a tremendous opportunity for the town and I, I hope very much that we will be successful because if we're not, um, our ability to put together a program like this um, won't come again. And the cost to individual homes of 15,000, uh, even today, it should be a minimum of 50,000. We, we, we know that. And if you uh, take away some of the funding sources, add escalation, uh, if we were to come back in future years, uh, you know, it, it may not be um, look at as good as this. Now, I just want to go over a couple of other costs that um, homeowners will have. The 15000 Do you mind taking a pause for questions at this point? Because 
we're going to, in a second, you're going to leave this cost component, right? Sure. Okay. So Let's questions from the committee on just the better, um, this cost component to the property owner, which yes. is setting aside the other um, revenue sources, better, we're talking about betterments. So, John? So, mind if I go to John first? Sure. Go ahead, go ahead. No, Lee? All right, go ahead, Lee. Um, yeah, Mr. Chairman, a question I have for Bob is, um, I know this is based on the model that we developed, and um, it looks pretty good. The question is, if would the betterment value change if our funding sources turned out to be better than, a, than we're estimating? And then vice versa, if our funding sources were not as good as we're projecting, would the cost, betterment cost, go up? That's really yes. Uh, yeah, I guess the answer to both of those questions um, is is yes. If if we were to lose parts of our funding program or not implement those, uh, we'd have more to make up through the the betterment. And um, <clears throat> I think this is a solid number. I, I think our revenues are very conservative and and very solid at, at this point. Um, and you know, the best example that I can give is the district improvement financing, we've been enormously conservative with, with those estimates. And um, if it will, it will take, you know, 10 to 15 years to see if that growth that comes in as a result of the infrastructure is much higher than our estimates, in which case it will help finance the future phases of this project. But um, I would say, um, overall, the, um, the model is solid. One item that is um, uncertain actually falls potentially to the good side that, again, our estimates we feel are conservative. In the state revolving loan fund program, um, we talked about the provisions that are currently in the regulations for loan forgiveness. You recall that? Um, and today, in the regulations that Yarmouth specifically qualifies for is on that overall 2.7 million that, that there's 6.6 percent that they have in their regulations that they intend to forgive that portion of the loan. Well, there are additional funds that the DEP has that have been assigned to the state revolving loan fund in excess of $30 million that they propose to use for potential additional loan forgiveness, but the regulations are not available, and they are not able to give us um, any estimate for what the town may qualify for. So when we put this financial model together, we can only use the exact regulations that are in place today. It may very well be that prior to the assessment of the betterments, a larger share of the loan is forgiven. So what that basically does is reduces the project. So if, if the cost of the project to the town were reduced, then we'd be able to proportionately reduce the betterment model so that it remains capped in that 15% module. And, and so that's what, that's what we're trying to do with this project is to, is to take the betterments. We know what portion of the project that we have estimated for those and if conditions change, we do not anticipate uh, major funding sources dropping out. But if, um, you know, that hypothetical scenario would negatively impact uh, betterments. But uh, what is more likely is potentially if we have additional loan forgiveness, we'll, we'll revisit this number to, to take it down a little. So one, one last question, question, Bob. Can we tell the public that what we have for betterments is going to be fixed, the number is going to be fixed, and that if there is a, a future cost uh, lower or higher, that we would pass that on to future phases? Or does, does that 
does the current phase, you know, not guaranteed on the betterment? Okay. The, um, if, if I'm getting your question, and please ask it again if I miss the point a little bit, but I think the key thing is that the way this project works is phase one is its own independent project. So that is what we're financing today based on all of the contracts, the appropriation, the betterments, everything. So we're prepared to say that phase one is fixed. The people won't be getting any surprises with the, with the numbers that um, this is where w the, the Board of Selectmen have indicated and um, the, they'll be capping that amount. So um, we're in good shape with phase one. Now, um, in future phases, we're not prepared today to say that we can cap future betterments because project costs, we have only rough estimates. And as time goes by, phase two is not set to take effect for another five years. Now, if the, if the cost remains constant, our proportional share remains constant. But it may very well be that we have to deal with um, escalation over time. Uh, you know, in this project, one of the most difficult things that we've been dealing with is had we done this project 10 years ago, it would have been far less, far less money. And in those 10 years, this project has escalated tremendously. So what we're trying to do today is freeze phase one. And if there are any additional funds that accrue, those can be used to help us move into phase two, phase three, and then phase four is down the line maybe um, 15 years or so. Uh, we're going to need some ad additional design work to make sure that, that those are able to, um, to be accomplished with the same amount. But what we're trying to do is put this in the best position. Phase one gets us the plant, and then anything that we have that can help us um, get into phase two as soon as we can, the more users that we have on this system will help with the operation of this plant. So I guess that yes to your question. Mary, you all set? Yes, I, I, I just think that, um, Mr. Chairman, I think that what Bob said um, at the closing of his remarks before we took Lee's comments and questions, that that's the most important thing to emphasize to citizens, especially based on probably the reasons it was defeated 10 years ago or so. And that is that um, this is, <laughs> there are only two alternatives, and this is certainly the most cost-effective one. And all of the efforts that the town has gone to, to fund it and keep the cost to the individual um, citizen users down to a much more um, acceptable level than it would be if we had to go with the other alternative, which is the IA systems. Um, I, I think that's the most compelling point to, to make at the town meeting. Thanks, Mary. George? No, I have no questions. All right, your light came on. I thought uh, I needed something. John? Yes. Um, I think the data presented is fabulous. Uh, we are uh, uh, finally looking at something that uh, will enable those of us that are uh, trying to explain in great detail to the citizens of the town what's involved. This is great, and the more we can distribute this before town meeting, the better. Uh, it may be, to, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I, I think uh, being able to say to the homeowner, uh, on a chart similar to what you have here, the betterment component, the homeowner's component is the following. We've got the 15,000 figure, and I assume you're going to go the rest of the way. With, okay, I'll stop. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Bob, just actually, can you just back up the very first slide, the where the funding sources are coming from? I just had the pie. The pie chart, thank you. Just had two questions on it. I think this chart is great, and Totally agree with John's statement that you know this absolutely needs to get out there to the public so they because that's really the question the questions that I'm hearing. I just really have a question on the funding sources that um, 
and, and I just asked the question, 25% of the funding is coming from the Cape, um, Cape Cod you know, Wastewater Trust Fund. And help me to understand, Bob, where that stands as far as application process. Is that money guaranteed now and set aside for us? So, you know, a fair amount of our projects is dependent on that, and I just want to understand that process. Well, the, the key thing that needs to be said is that over time, the Cape Cod Water Protection Trust will need additional funds. Mm -hmm. That 2.75% over the next 30 years will not be sufficient to meet all of the um, Cape Cod Town's needs. And so that, that we know, but it is, it is well funded now with the 2.75% um, that goes in there. And the way that that process works is that, um, you know, they don't give us 25% of, of 200 million. Um, they are designed to work hand in hand with the SRF program. The town of Yarmouth will never see these funds. The way it works is that the application to the Water um, Protection Trust, if you are a member, which Yarmouth um, is a member of that, is the application for the SRF. So when you get approved through the SRF for a wastewater project, they work directly with SRF and they approve up to 25% of all eligible costs. And the way that the, the funds are dispersed is that um, the SRF puts together their financing and they determine what your annual cost will be and then um, a bill goes to the trust for 25% of that and another bill goes to the town. So they pay on an annual basis uh, the 25% of what you would have been paying and that way, you know, they do it over a long period of time and so that gives us a little more time to make sure in future years that we're able to get more money in that trust. Um, but that's the way the regulations are, are set up today, which we're going by um, today, and so it's uh, an automatic distribution. So we're already applied to it because we applied to the SRF and our application has been accepted. Okay. One last follow-up on this, just forgive my ignorance on it, because I'm new to the board, but help me, the 4.5% from solar, uh, help me to understand that one piece of it. Um, the town has issued a, a lease for um, a solar field that would be located at property. Um, it's actually up at the, the top of Station Avenue. Okay. And um, so we have the leases in place, and the developer is Amoresco. And as we move into the uh, later years of the project, there's approximately 300000 of projected revenue from solar that um, we've indicated, and the town doesn't have to do this, but this was another source of funding potentially um, that we put towards trying to reduce the cost to individual properties. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and for me, Bob, uh, spreadsheets, are they available? How, how do we get a look at them? Who's got them? You're presenting them in a public meeting, so I presume they're ready to be made public. Um, yes, the the model, I, I think at, at this point, we're um, going to be putting on the town's website and um, we're also going to be making a presentation to the Board of Selectmen um, tomorrow evening. The um, spreadsheet essentially examines the um, individual number of units by each property class. So we're not publishing you know, information on you know, your individual property, but we have all of the data um, available in a spreadsheet that's going to be on the town's website. Um, so the idea is that any business, um, any individual person can readily and easily discern what the exact amount of their assessment will be, and we also uh, can assist with that process as, as well. My interest is uh, as much transparency as possible. Let as many uh, residents, business owners, or property owners um, go at the information and satisfy themselves. It, um, allows them to answer the questions before they get a chance to ask us. So you're going to move on to the second cost component, which is um, direct cost to the uh, property owner to connect. And are you also going to address the third cost component, which is the um, capital surcharge? So um, I'll address each of those items uh, in terms of the, the total cost for the system. So. With the funding allocation that we've gone over and the betterments, that is the lion's share of things. It, it's the how you fund 207 million without an override. 
um, and at as low a cost to individual uh, property owners as possible. And the um, two remaining cost components that individual residents and businesses will see is first and foremost, what is not in the initial construction cost is the actual connection, a, a service connection to the property. And we estimate that and in conjunction with also decommissioning the septic system that is on site, that is at each property. Um, it is a cost for a single family home of approximately um, eight to ten thousand dollars per home. And uh, there's a, a fund we're working through the county. They have the county septic loan program that has been recently rebranded, rebranded as the Aqua Fund program, and they are offering um, low interest loans on a sliding scale by income for those connection costs. And we're going to be working with local residents to assist them. Um, on the commercial side, uh, there are also some local banks that you know we're working with the Chamber of Commerce and uh, other groups to, to highlight um, some of the commercial options that will assist for businesses, depending on the size of your connection. Um, it, in all likelihood, may exceed that eight to ten thousand figure for connection, um, but there are engineering resources that are available to evaluate your plan and, and develop an, an estimate for the connection of the larger commercial um, units and we can assist in that process as well. So there is a connection fee and the part about what is required, um, a lot of folks have this question and we've been working with local residents on this uh, with the leadership of the Board of Health and Jay Garner, our health director, what do we have to do with our septic system? It does not have to be excavated in order to connect to wastewater. Uh, they simply require you to um, fill it with the, usually you could use the material that um, was used to dig your service line. But um, the septic system can remain in place for you know, a lower cost option to, to local residents. And, and that is included in that eight to 10,000 connection fee, which also includes the inspections um, and the engineering cost to take care of your septic system and the full connection. So um, folks should be aware of that. And the third and final piece um, that, that we have the 14% um, overall cost is that when the plant becomes operational, it's gonna operate similar to the water system where um, every resident gets an annual bill for the operation of the plant. Now, this is the point, and I, I think we covered this a, a little earlier, that we switch from, it's no longer the design flow which we use to calculate the proportionate comparison between property uses. The operation and maintenance of the facility will be based on your actual usage. So whether um, you're a seasonal resident or a seasonal business, or you take specific actions to lower your water use, that will lower your bill for operation and maintenance. That is right under the control of the user. So there's a, a user fee to operate the plant that's based on the actual measured flow at your property. And it is also anticipated that on that bill, there will be a 25% a surcharge just of the bill amount that will also help defray the capital costs. So um, not 100% of the cost is based on just um, the use. And, and I think it should be a big help to some of the businesses that um, if you have that O&M, you're able to impact that if you have um, conservation for water um, because it's only based on how much you actually pump, what your, your actual flow is. And those are the three components. But um, other than that, you know, you don't have a septic system that um, might have to be replaced. You don't have any monitoring. That is all done um, by the town, and, and it's um, a much more permanent solution, and it is, is far more effective in protecting the environment. Can I um, 
Can I help you eliminate a little confusion on the numbers? F you mentioned 14 percent is the amount that that capital surcharge is contributing to the overall cost, but the actual surcharge is how much? It's 25 percent of what your bill, what you, uh, what your wastewater bill is. All so those combined 25 percent aggregate to 14 percent of the project cost. That's correct. Great. And um, adding to the litany of things you're not going to have to do in the future, and that one of them is pump your septic tank. There's exactly. a cost, inherent cost savings there. Um, questions for Bob? Could, could we uh, develop a number uh, what the actual operating use figure is going to be in terms of dollars based oh. on that average three-bedroom house that we started with? How much is 25% of that? What, 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 is, well, what is the projected cost to the homeowner on a monthly basis? Well, for, for the O&M, we don't have the, the o, a projected O&M cost per house, I don't think, yet. Well, that, that's highly variable, too. Even right now, when we have people that have uh, their water bills, and it's based upon water usage, as Bob's talking about, uh, you have people that are on the, the low end of the scale might just pay uh, a couple hundred dollars a year, and you have people that are on the higher end of the scale that are paying a couple thousand dollars a year. So it's highly variable. But the numbers based upon the budgets we've been putting together, and I've been working closely with town administration to project what that operational budget will look like when the plant is up and running. That's well, several I, I years just, in the future. I, but I, I think if we have what I'll call anchor points uh, as we go to town meeting, let's say for conversation, a homeowner has in the aggregate uh, $500 water bill. Uh, people can interpolate plus or minus from that. Uh, what would they be paying for sewer on an annual basis in terms of dollars? We can try to relate it to water, but what I was going to say, your average homeowner is probably looking at something between six and $800 per year for a sewer bill. Okay. But again, highly variable based upon water usage. You'll have people below that, you'll have people above that. Again, it's hard to nail down an average, and how to exactly relate it to water um, will be a little difficult because it's going to be uh, what costs to operate the wastewater treatment plant, not what it costs to pump the water. They're really two completely separate enterprise funds, but we can take a look at that. I think the, the point is that we're getting very close, but to the extent that somebody comes to town meeting and says, what's it going to cost me as the homeowner uh, in year one? And we can say, okay, the allocation is the, you know, the betterment is one thing. We well understand that, and you finance it over 30 years. Now, once you get hooked up, and you're going to have to come up with 10 grand one way or the other, and the aqua fund can help pay for that. That's part two. Part three is, okay, now I'm live, I'm hooked up. What's what's it going to be on a monthly basis? You know, that people want to work out a budget between their cable television, you name it, electric, gas. Thanks. Thank you for that. That's excellent. Anybody else? Lee? No. Um, I, I kind of agree with John that um, for a single family home that has, let's say, four people, two children, uh, and two parents, um, can we come up with some typical water usage? Uh, derive it out of maybe some something we know and come up with a value for an annual cost. Can we do that? Yes. Absolutely, and I think I just mentioned what that was, but um, it, it's highly variable. Um, I have the same number of people in my house today that I did 10 years ago, but I now have three teenagers and the water usage, uh, my bill has tripled. So we can certainly look at that. Uh, the people haven't changed, the usage has, uh, but we'll certainly take a look at that closer. Let me, let me just make sure we're, we're beating this horse to death. Um, we, at the same time as discussing the 25% surcharge on the sewer bill, we introduced the sewer bill. So the third cost is actually a sewer bill, which now has 125% cost, right? So. It is not the water bill. It's, it's a separate and distinct bill, which I don't know if we're going to be billing them together, but nevertheless, it's an addition to. So that could run us in a spectrum of 200 to 
pick a number where you fit on that. And on top of that, we're going to lay the 25%. Correct. So those are th when we're calculating out um, an estimate for a th single family homeowner, a three bedroom property, it'll be those three pieces that we're adding together to give folks an idea. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I guess my only comment to this whole thing is certainly where it's all being circled around is that we better have these answers prior to town meeting because that's certainly going to be one of the questions I'm sure that if I was at town meeting, and I will be there, that I'd be asking is what's the cost to me? Certainly understanding, you know, from what you've explained, Bob, I think you've done a marvelous job trying to get the cost under control for, this, for the homeowner. But they, they're they going to want to know, and we better be prepared to explain it, what their overall cost is, is going to be. Because that's really what it comes down to, is when they're writing the check. Any committee members? So, um, Bob, thank you for the presentation. I have uh, kind of a technical question on subsequent article. The betterment interest... Um, article is given a number is that on the warrant as well yes it is the betterment interest article is um, I think it may be article 20 they're all there's three articles on wastewater and they're clustered together 18 19 and 20 18 19 and 20 and that will approve the overall project it will approve the district financing for the project and it will approve the low interest rate for the betterments, which last year we did the 30-year. This year we do the low interest. I don't want to put you on the spot. We can do these numbers um, again at another point. Article 20 is limiting the uh, percent charged on spreading out the betterment charges to 2%. Is that what you said? Yeah, I'll be real specific when people see the article so you understand what exactly is going on. Uh, we're accepting a specific local option general law statute. So there's a general law that if the town accepts it, what, what the normal statutory interest rate for all betterments is 5%. Mm -hmm. That's what the, the state law says. When you do a betterment, you charge 5%. Now, if you adopt this section that we propose to adopt, it allows you to set that interest rate at 2% higher than what the town's borrowing interest rate is. And in this particular project, we're proposing to fund it with the 0% SRF program. So that kicks in that the, the rate will be 2%. So the article doesn't say 2%. It says 2% over what the town borrows at, which will be zero. So that creates that 2%. And f just for all the geeks in the room, 2% for, for the duration of the, of the borrowing for the total amount, or is that 2% a year? It is 2% annually. Okay. So for another day, the math I'd like to sort of figure out for the homeowner is $15,000 times 2%. Annual. So if, if you do that, it's $510 per year. That, that's, that's my question. We should probably run the, the calculator around and see what that really is. It's 500 bucks a year times 30 years is $15,000. That's zero interest. 2% will get you a little bit more than $510. Not to put you on the spot, we'll go over those numbers at right, we'll <laughs> some other point. We'll show you the, the chart. $510 is 2% for the duration of the loan, 2% over the whole amount forever. 2% a year is $300 a year. Not $300 for the I whole thing. Bob's figures had the amortization in it. At the, the, the yeah, the, you have to look at how the chart calculates out. We'll, we'll show you the chart, and so we'll have those numbers in detail. Terrific. Um, I think we may have con uh, uh, gone over the next item on the agenda, regulatory permitting update. That was part of your presentation. Unless Jeff wants to add something. Uh, I don't specifically have anything to add. I think it was the last slide of CDM Smith's uh, presentation. 
Yeah, I think we skipped over it, Mr. Chair. That's fine. Not nothing new to to dwell on. Um, we had a couple of items on the last slide. Uh, SRF that we've talked about over the course of the meeting. Uh, the groundwater discharge permit is still out there, and as Lou had indicated, uh, we had an internal meeting with town staff to sort of strategize, and we're awaiting a subsequent meeting with DEP to discuss it further. Uh, we've had a number of those meetings, um, and we talked about land use controls last time as well. Um, so that still needs to be addressed as well. Close enough. Um, we were all sent a communications plan which refers to um, the town's um, initiative to put as much of this information out in front of um, the public as possible and how that's going to play out over the next, next few weeks. Um, each of the committee members has that. Um, rather than delve into it item by item, do we all, anyone have a comment about it or a question about it? And it's also in deference to the time. It's 5.30, we typically don't um, uh, go very much longer than this, but whatever your pleasure. Nope. Uh, Bob, just for everyone else's edification, two minutes on what the communication plan is. Certainly, the, um, the key thing that you know we face as a community that is a tremendous challenge is all of this information, it's a large project, it's a very complicated project, and one of the things that um, we suffer from in our community since uh, local newspapers, um, there's no more register, we have a very difficult time getting newspaper coverage, um, it's very difficult in, um, with the local cable TV, it, it just presents an enormous challenge with getting information like this in the households of, of each local resident, and it's exceedingly important that we be 1,000% transparent, just as the discussion with the finances went this evening. It's a fascinating discussion, but if people don't receive this information, it's a disservice to the town, and, and I think that was one of the things that the Board of Selectmen um, really took to heart when we began planning this process and um, they have um, authorized us to put together a communication team and to bring on some professional support um, that w is helping us to develop a brochure, a mailer, uh, information that we can provide, uh, mail out to every local resident in town so they have the details and they can make up their own mind based on, on what the facts are. Um, we'll also be um, because of the extreme importance of this issue as an environmental issue facing our town, um, we're going to be taking an advocacy role in trying to um, urge folks to consider the information, to vote in favor of, of the article. Um, we're going to be sending our brochure and information out to each and every one of the neighborhood associations um, in town. Uh, we're going to be um, working to do some limited um, advertising to put uh, links to the town's website on social media. We're going to be um, pushing that so people uh, on whether you're on Facebook or other social media that um, you'll see a link that will pop up that you can go right to the town's website, get more information about the project. We're also going to be working with um, local radio um, stations to um, try to get on the air, present more information. So. We're developing um, a fairly comprehensive process that's designed to share this information that we're discussing right here today with local residents so they have the benefit of that information. We're also making a video uh, that we'll be able to show on the government channel. Um, so we have a, a list of about eight or ten different action items that are designed to make it so that when people get to town meeting, um, you know, that, that's the worst thing on a project that's this big. I haven't heard about this. How come I haven't heard about this? Um, what, what's the information? And, and you know, frankly, um, we don't want people hearing about this project and the details of the project for the first time at town meeting. We think that that would be a, a disservice um, and a mistake. So uh, we're working very hard at a communication problem uh, um, program. And if folks have ideas, other things that we can do, um, we're also, you know, planning some hearings and forums 
and to try to just get the community as engaged as possible. So um, please participate. I, I want to thank the, the RAC. Spiro has been a, a key person in our communications team, making sure that we cross every T and dot every I, and it's been very, very much appreciated. Thanks, Bob. We have an estimated um, date for some of that communication hitting the uh, residents, property owners, recipients. It should be next week. We've got the, um, the brochures and material um, after many, many rewrites. That's one thing. It's a good thing we had a large communication team because we had a lot of input. Um, but uh, material is being printed this week, and we hope to do some mailings um, by early April. Okay, so folks will start seeing that in their mailbox in a week or so. Tomorrow, the selectmen are meeting. Uh, this item on their agenda? This um, yes, in fact, there are two key issues for dates that I think would be of very much um, interest to the committee. Um, tomorrow, we're going to be doing an update for the Board of Selectmen that walks us through the entire project, including the financing issues, things that we've talked about today. Uh, we'll try to um, maybe address any, any of the gaps as soon as tomorrow if we can. And I think that, that'll be a good opportunity um, to hopefully vet the project um, a little bit more. So we'll have the update tomorrow. That's March 27, Board of Selectmen. That meeting starts at 6 p.m. And um, on April 4, at the Board of Selectmen, also we're going to have a walkthrough of our annual town meeting warrant. Um, and that'll cover all of the articles, but it'll be another opportunity when we hit those articles 18, 19, and 20 to um, have a public presentation on some of the details for wastewater and get some questions. So uh, in terms of tomorrow evening, um, do you request the presence of this committee at the Selectmen's meeting? I, I think that'd be great as many folks um, that, that can come and you know quite honestly you know it's it'd be great to, to see you know some support and I think um, the Board of Selectmen just like um, you know the public uh, need to hear um, when yeah. everything is distilled down how does how does the committee look at things is this something that's favorable so um, if it's possible to express some um, positive statements at the Selectmen's meeting that'd be great. great. Mr. Chairman, I'd suggest a positive statement is a vote of support of the project or So I guess article? that's where I was leading with all of this. Um, we've been um, given a significant update today um, on the, uh, the issue of financing and um, who's paying for this project and how much is costing individual groups or classifications of groups. Um, so I kind of want to throw it back to the committee to say, to ask if they were um, sufficiently educated or uh, informed on the subject that they wanted to pass judgment on any part of it this evening. Um, but that's really up to you folks at this point. In hand in hand with that, we're slated to meet one more time before town meeting, which would be April 10th. April 10th, yes. April 10th. Um, if um, there's an opportunity to express a formal um, position, April 10th might be an option, if you'd like to wait that long. I think Bob was hedging a little bit by saying, why don't you guys come tomorrow and say some nice stuff about <laughs> the project, which we're happy to do. But it's really up to you if you want to um, take a position more formally. So that would require a little discussion and then maybe a motion. John? Well, uh, <laughs> I don't know if this is the right time or not, but it's probably going to come up at town meeting anyway. So, uh, I, concerning the linkage of the water bill to the operating uh, costs, um, some conversation about uh, irrigation systems. Uh, for many a homeowner, uh, irrigation can be easily double an annual water bill. Um, and query, do we, as a policy matter, keep home irrigation linked, or do we consider uh, a two-track system, for the lack of a better label, 
uh, was, I don't know whether that means two meters or what, but um, just putting it out there and the idea of getting as many of the issues as possible on the table to be thought about before town meeting so that we at least have uh, a thoughtful response when it, when it comes up. So I can just um, put some color on that. If we're talking about that, we're, we're past the stage of going forward, yeah. right? <laughs> I don't think that's going to be the issue which makes or breaks th the project. But um, rather than engage in a uh, substantive conversation about it, maybe Jeff would want to volunteer. Where exactly would a decision like that fall in town government? The sewer commissioners? That's up to the sewer commissioners on how they want to set the rate structure. That's you know one of the reasons I had mentioned before that it's highly variable. If it's part of the uh, overall sewer bill and water usage, it's you know uh, that that's one thing. If you're going to subtract that out and you know share that cost over a, a much smaller number with the irrigation backed out of it, uh, that that's going to be a much different number. So that's why it's it's highly variable. Uh, the sewer commissioners will ultimately make that decision when they set the rates. And I can say that there's communities that do it both ways, and we're very familiar with those. There's some that will have a, a separate meter, which uh, has its own challenges with regards to uh, replumbing, uh, and there's communities that have decided to use it as a, a total uh, usage of water. I'd suggest that uh, based upon some of the things I've heard from DEP and others, they'd like to see it as a total water usage because that is a conservation tool. Uh, people will then use less water if they know they've got to pay for it on the other end as well. Back to the question at hand, does anyone want to um, uh, speak to supporting the project as it's presented, um, has been presented to us over the past uh, few months and couple of years to get to this point where we're going to town meeting to request funding through Article 18 to uh, implement those plans? Mr. Chairman, I think we should very definitely so formally support the project before town meeting. Is it your pleasure to do today or to wait till April 10? I don't see why we couldn't do it today. Great. Would you First. like to make a motion? <laughs> I'm sorry. Is there a further discussion on this? I'll be happy to make a motion. Uh, and I also make a comment. Uh, the Finance Committee has. Uh, uh, explicitly supported the project in our reports in town meeting. Great. Great. And, that's and you know that, George, because you're on the Finance Committee. Correct. Very nice. So one of the one of the virtues of being a chair is you don't actually have to make the motion. <laughs> so I'm waiting for you guys. Oh, I, I've already made it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I just got caught up in the comment. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? So we should hurry up before anybody changes their minds. I'll take a call, I'll take a, um, uh, a vote. Uh, Mary. Aye. Lee. Aye. George. Aye. John. Aye. Ken. Aye. And I too support. It's a unanimous uh, vote to support the um, project and Article 18 specifically um, on the town warrant. I hope that's beneficial. Lee, you've been a tremendous spokesman for the committee in the past. Is it uh, by any chance planning to go to the selectmen's meeting tomorrow evening? I'm, I'm not sure okay. if uh, Bob, if is we it the practice of the selectmen still to have Zoom uh, meet yes. Zoom participation? Yes, the hybrid participation is fine. Is that something that you would be willing to do if we can nail down a more specific time? Yes. Great. I also plan to attend in person in case. Um, that's of any use, and I'll leave it up to the other committee members to jump online or to be in the room as well. I don't suppose you know where we are in the agenda tomorrow. I, the ballpark. I think it's I think it's six forty-five. Okay, so that gives everyone a pretty good idea of when we need to be there. Mr. Chairman, could you have the link sent out for that, please? That meeting tomorrow night. Week? Sure. I, don't think that's a problem sending it out. I think it's already online. If you go look for the selectman's agenda, okay. you just click the okay, selectman's I'll agenda. Um, 
Um, 6.45 at the moment. Would you like to uh, do the minutes or hold them for next meeting? I make a motion that we uh, approve, approve the minutes of the 13th, is it? Second. Who's seconding? Second. Ten seconds. Any um, additions, subtractions, corrections to the minutes of March 13th? Having heard none, let's take a vote. Mary? I'm abstaining because I, I didn't receive them. Okay. Lee? Aye. John? Aye. Ken? Aye. And myself, aye. That's still four in the affirmative. George is not present either at that meeting. Uh, that brings us to the end of the agenda, aside from one item that we, uh, sorry for that. Mr. Bishop, friends of Bass River are always in the house. Uh, would you like to <laughs> make your presence known? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, Rick Bishop, Executive Director for the Friends of Bass River. And I'd like to update you uh, as to the status of our Upper Bass River Headwaters project. Uh, specific to the, the wetlands portion of the project, uh, we have uh, gone through the first phase of uh, MEPA uh, permitting. And the good news is that they were willing to waive the EIR component, which will save us a great deal of time and about $45,000. So that's moving along quite well. Uh, we are approaching the 100% uh, completion of the design document for the 57.2 acres of wetlands. And we are also uh, just starting on our uh, design of the Weir Road culvert replacement bridge. So we've, uh, we've maintained our, our, our movement quite well. Thank you very much. And I'd like to congratulate Bob and Bill on the excellent presentation tonight. It was really wonderful. I'm sure every environmental consultant in Massachusetts is very happy for you not having to do any IR going forward. <laughs> um, we left the I last item in the agenda as a placeholder in case uh, there was an interest in having discussion about reorganization. Um, at the last meeting, and you just approved it in the minutes, uh, we decided to wait till after town meeting. So as long as that's still your pleasure, we're just going to wait until we get past town meeting to reorganize um, the structure of this committee. And now we'll take a vote to adjourn. Well, actually, let me have a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn till next meeting. And John seconds. Lee? Aye. Mary? Aye. George? Aye. Ken? All right. John all right. and myself, I thank you all for participating. See you on April 10th.